A pig. Once upon a time, there was a little brown pig named Esmeralda. Esmeralda was a contented pig. She loved her lovely bucket of swill in the morning. She loved the neighbor's children who came to talk to her and scratch her back with a stick. She loved the weather and the flowers in the fields and the birds along the fences and even the flapping washing on the line. She loved her lovely bucket of swill in the evening. Best of all, she loved Mrs. Harbottle. Esmeralda lived with Mrs. Harbottle, who, sad to say, owned only half of her. Mr. Harbottle owned the other half. Now that he and Mrs. Harbottle were divorced, Mr. Harbottle wanted his half. Mr. Harbottle was a horrid man with uncombed hair and dirty fingernails. All he ever ate was sausages. He had eaten so many that really he looked like a sausage. A sausage with a hat on and a bristly chin. Mr. Harbottle came one day and banged on the door. Where's my half of a pig? Go away, cried Mrs. Harbottle. Mr. Harbottle poked his head through the window. Where is it? None of your business, cried Mrs. Harbottle, and she hit him on the nose with the spoon. In the afternoon, Rose and Billy, the children from next door, came round and talked to Esmeralda and scratched her back with a stick. Later on, they found Mrs. Harbottle crying in the kitchen. What are you crying for, Mrs. Harbottle, said Billy. And Mrs. Harbottle told him and cried some more. It's sausages, she sobbed. That's all he sees in Esmeralda. That dreadful man, no sympathetic feelings at all. Mrs. Harbottle shook like a sad jelly in her easy chair. Can't think what I ever saw in him. Rose and Billy patted her shoulders and made her a cup of tea. That night, the Swiggins brothers came and banged on the door and broke it down. They said Mr. Harbottle had sent them, and where was his half of a pig? Esmeralda was hiding upstairs under Miss Harbottle's bed. The brothers found her and prodded her out with a broom handle. Esmeralda, who was slippery and quick, got away from them and bolted down the stairs, out the back and straight into the pokey sack that the Swiggin sisters had waiting for her. Poor Mrs. Harbottle sitting on her front step in the moonlight and her night tie, wondering what to do. Poor Esmeralda, tied up in the pokey sack, bouncing about in the back of the brother's van. Bad Swiggin brothers and sisters doing Mr. Harbottle's dirty work for him. But brave, yes brave, Rose and Billy on their bikes now, still in their pajamas and following the van. Rose and Billy had been woken up by the wreck at Mrs. Harbottle's. From their bedroom window, they could see the shadowy figures rushing in and out, the clatter of rockery, Mrs. Harbottle throwing cups, and see and hear the wriggling, squealing, pokey sack. The Swiggins brothers in their van did not go far, just through the village dropping their sisters off at the pig and whistle, and out the other side to a deserted barn. Rose and Billy left their bikes in the lane and hid in the hedge. Moonlight lay across the fields like floodlights at a football match. The barn door was open, a light flickering inside. An owl and its shadow swooped silently across the yard. A pig oinked. Meanwhile, Mrs. Harbottle was dyeing her eyes and getting dressed. Mr. Harbottle was just finishing a plate of sausages in the pig and whistle. The Swiggin sisters were leaning over his table, whispering to him. Inside the barn, the brothers Melvin and Roger had put together a small pig pen using some wooden hurdles. Esmeralda had been released into it, and now the brothers were gazing at her and scratching their heads. 
while high up in the loft, Rose and Billy were gazing at them. What'd you reckon then, Rog? said Melvin. Well, it's half in it, said Roger. I mean half. That's what E said. Er, but which half? Now the brothers were climbing into the pen. Melvin grabbed Esmeralda while Roger took a blue felt pen from his pocket and drew an untidy sort of line around her middle. Does that look like half to you? Melvin let go of Esmeralda and put his glasses on. Hmm, hard to say. Meanwhile, Mrs. Harbottle was on the phone to Constable Murphy, and Mr. Harbottle had left the pig and whistle. Furthermore, the weather was changing. A cold front was moving in, and dark clouds were skimming the moon. Back in the barn, the perplexed brothers were seated now on sacks of fertilizer, pondering. We gotta do this properly, you know, said Melvin. Of course we have. She's a good woman, that Mrs. Harbottle. She is. Deserves her half as well. She does. Not three-eighths. No, Roger was nodding his head, nor seven-sixteenths neither. Melvin stood up and stared again at Esmeralda. We could always weigh her, I suppose. Yeah, said Roger, and a thought occurred to him. We could mince her. Whereupon, there came a high-pitched echoing scream from up in the rafters. No! A heavy bale of straw came tumbling down. It hit Roger on the shoulder, knocking him sideways into Melvin, who fell on and smashed one of the hurdles, releasing the imprisoned Esmeralda who took to her trotters and run. Meanwhile, Billy, the screamer, and Rose, the bail thrower, were climbing back down the outside ladder. Mrs. Harbottle was the Constable Murphy at the scene of the crime. Mr. Harbottle was just opening the barn door. Esmeralda seized her chance. As the door swung open, she charged into the gap, landing Mr. Harbottle a painful blow to his tummy. Down into the mud he fell, it was raining now, only to be trampled on as he was struggling to his feet by the brothers as they charged out. Ah, Mr. H., cried Melvin. How are you, sir? Mr. Harbottle did not reply, partly because Melvin was still kneeling on him. At this point, I almost forgot a number of excellent words and noises now made their contribution to the story. Thus, bang, Esmeralda colliding with Mr. Harbottle. Splat! Mr. Harbottle hitting the mud. Thump! Melvin landing on Mr. Harbottle. Arr! Roger landing on Melvin. Also well, I remember, purplish, which Mr. Harbottle's previously sausage-colored face had become. Oh, yes. And a little earlier. Oor! From Roger in response to Billy's scream. Actually, Mr. Harbottle, I regret to say, made use of one or two other words at this time, which I don't believe your parents or teachers would wish you to hear or read. On with the story, or rather chase with, which is what it had now become. Esmeralda ran down the lane back towards the high street with Melvin, Roger, and Mr. Harbottle in pursuit, and Rose and Billy in pursuit of them. A crowd of happy customers were leaving the pig and whistle, calling fond farewells to each other and opening their umbrellas. Stop that pig, yelled Mr. Harbottle, but Esmeralda skipped past them. Esmeralda did not run into the pig and whistle. If that is what you were thinking, it would have made a good joke, I suppose. But there again, pigs have a little sense of humor. Besides, rewriters must stick with the truth, and it never happened. Instead, Esmeralda darted down an alley and jumped over a gate. The chasing group, plus two or three adventurous young people from the pub, were close behind. Slipping now and then in the wet conditions, blundering into the darkness, Mr. Harbottle, bruised and battered, was in the lead. Suddenly, he stopped in his tracks and let out a muffled cry. Oh! Something wet and scary was wrapping itself around his head. It was only washing on a line, but Mr. Harbottle was not to know that, nor was Roger right behind him, who caught a glimpse of his frightful 
flabbergasting thing and thought he had seen a ghost again. Meanwhile, Esmeralda trotted purposely along like the pied pig piper she led those villains, by the nose as it were, straight and true across a couple of gardens, in and out a clump of nettles, back at last, full circle, to her own home patch, her own dear owner, and the strong arms of the law. Constable Murphy was sharing an umbrella with Mrs. Harbottle as he stood out in the garden looking for clues. Suddenly, bursting into view in the light from the kitchen window and the constable's torch, came Esmeralda, closely followed, it seemed, by some kind of mad mud man with a pair of underpants on his head. Mrs. Herbato was overjoyed to see Esmeralda, and vice versa. She fell onto her knees and cuddled that little pig with no regard for the mud which transferred itself to her, or the rain which was still falling. Mr. Harbottle and the Swiggins brothers stood gasping and streaming in the torchlight. Any thoughts of escape were dashed by the presence of Constable Murphy's dog, who was watching them closely. As he recovered his wits, Mr. Harbottle tried to talk his way out of things. We have done nothing wrong, officer, he said. Just out for a little stroll. Me and my friends here. Yeah, friends, said Melvin. We happen to come upon this pig, continued Mr. Harbottle. And sort of chased it like, said Roger, but only to return it to its rightful half-owner, concluded Mr. Harbottle. A likely story, said Constable Murphy. I think he meant unlikely, and he gazed protectively at Mrs. Harbottle. I know who'd I believe. Ah, yes, officer, but you see, it's only her word against mine. No witnesses, added Melvin cheerfully. No proof, cried Roger. Whereupon up spoke Rose and B Billy. There were witnesses. Hooray! cried one of the young men from the pub. Rose and Billy were witnesses. They had witnessed it all. And as for proof... Look at that blue line there, cried Rose. Round Esmeralda's middle. He drew that. No, I never, said Roger. Yes, you did. You're going to chop up poor Esmeralda up. It's a lie. Oh, no, cried Melvin and Mrs. Harbottle together. They're gonna mince her, added Billy. Shane, cried the same young man from the pub. Constable Murphy crouched down and shone his torch on Esmeralda's tummy. The incriminating line was plain to see. Must have been waterproof, that pen, muttered Melvin, as he was being handcuffed to his brother. Mr. Harbottle, meanwhile, had taken a step or two backwards with the thought, perhaps, of making a run for it. A growl from the constable's dog persuaded him otherwise. The dog's name, by the way, maybe you worked it out, was Slugger. So here we are, almost at the end. There's just the food, I think, the tug-of-war, a bit more weather, and that should be about it. A few days later, Mrs. Harbottle made a picnic for Rose and Billy as a reward for all their bravery and cleverness. It had most of their favorite foods in it, pizza, beans, jelly, and so on. And the weather was fine. A ridge of high pressure covered the country and the sun, the sun shone down from a cloudless sky. Heave! Across the river, a crowd was watching the annual pig and whistle charity tug of war. Ladies versus gentlemen, the Swiggins brothers out on bail were heavily away, and the Swiggins sisters too. Of Mr. Harbottle, there was no sign, but let's forget about him and them. Back to the picnic. Esmeralda was there, crunchy daintily on a turnip, and surprisingly perhaps, or her, perhaps not, Constable Murphy was also there, looking rather dashing in jeans and a check. Sure. It was his day off. For that matter, Mrs. Harbottle looked charming, too, in a pretty pale green dress and plum-colored cardigan. Pig and Whistle. Would you care for a slice of angel cake, Sean? said Mrs. Harbottle. Thank you, Daphne. That would be delightful, said Constable Murphy. And he smiled shyly. And so did she. Conclusion 
I know I forgot the baked albergine and the noodles. Not really picnic food, are they? And the rope, I thought it might come in handy. And worst of all, the hippopotamus. I must have been mad, or overconfident at least. There's obviously no place for a hippopotamus in a story like this. There again, in some other story. Have you ever thought of writing a story? Hmm. It can be great fun, you know. Really. All you need is a pen, a bit of paper, and a few words. Words like rope, for instance, noodles maybe, and hippo, pata, mus. The end.